According to the British Association for the Advancement of Science, infectious childhood diseases decreased 90% between 1850 and 1940. The medical profession hold vaccinations as being largely responsible for this decrease, and yet it mostly occurred before the introduction of vaccines. So if vaccines weren't responsible, what was? Well, the answer to that is both simple and quite complex. To start with an obvious contender, we have the massive social changes brought about by the Industrial Revolution. During this period, in the late 18th and early 19th centuries in most parts of the world, people had left rural communities to work in the cities in what were often squalid and cramped living conditions as shown here. To start with the unglamorous but nonetheless essential subject of sewerage. In London, the River Thames was an open sewer up until what became known as the Great Stink of 1858, when proposals to provide proper sewers were finally enacted. In the years that followed, some 14,000 miles of sewers were constructed, and here you see the grand opening of at least part of the underground network of tunnels, carrying effluent away from the city for proper processing a few years later. Other lesser cities around the world were to follow suit shortly afterwards. The advent of household plumbing and soap meant that people could wash more frequently, and even the arrival of affordable cotton clothing meant that they could afford changes of clothes and could wash their clothes. The affordability of shoes, too, meant that children in particular weren't running around in raw sewage in bare feet, as had been the case as shown here. The building of the railways brought an improved supply of fresh foods to many parts, too, and refrigeration and improvements in food preservation meant that food was fresher and more hygienic. Better nursing practices and proper hydration helped to prevent deaths for those that became ill. And somewhat later in the day, there was also the advent of antibiotics including chloramphenicol and tetracycline, which helped to reduce mortality in those who contracted these diseases. This concept was underscored by a World Health Organization report which found that the disease and mortality rates in third world countries have no direct correlation with immunisation procedures or medical treatment but are closely related to the standard of hygiene and diet. In the words of Hans Rusch in his 1991 book Slaughter of the Innocent, the medical historians of our century agree that the decline of the epidemics which had wrought havoc in the Middle Ages was not due to the introduction of vaccination but of hygiene for they diminished long before large-scale inoculations had begun. So the credit given to vaccinations for our current disease incidents may simply have been grossly exaggerated or completely misattributed. Now to move on to the second, more complex reason why vaccination may never have and could never and can never protect us from infectious diseases, and that is that we have fundamentally the wrong conceptual model about the nature of these pathogens. Our whole current allopathic paradigm is wedded to, and largely based upon, germ theory as conceived of by Louis Pasteur in late 19th century Paris. He maintained that microbial agents of external origin attack us and that they are monomorphic, which literally means one body or form, so that the measles virus is always a measles virus, for example. Pasteur's contemporaries and rivals in Paris at the time were Professor Antoine Beauchamp and Claude Bernard, and their work has largely been ignored or actively suppressed. Antoine Beauchamp formulated a completely different theory, that of pleomorphism, or the cellular theory of disease. What this says is that our blood is alive and intelligent and contains tiny granules he called microzymas. You can see these granules in the background of this dark field microscope image of blood with red blood cells outlined in the foreground. The microzymas are actually of plant origin and were the ground of all life, according to Beauchamp. The microzymas change dynamically in response to toxic changes in what he referred to as the terrain of the body into first bacteria, then yeasts, and then viruses. That is, that these organisms are pleomorphic, meaning many-bodied, and can morph from one form into another. Just a couple of examples of this are shown here. First is the morphing of a long, rod-shaped bacteria into a round, cocky bacteria. These are video stills, but this occurred in a matter of moments. Second is an example showing washed red blood cells that have been placed in a nutrient solution containing glucose. 
Within minutes, the red blood cells have morphed into tentacle-like fungal forms which break off to become Y-shaped before morphing into a row of bacterial cocci that are then released into the solution. As we know, science embraced Pasteur's germ theory and Beauchamp's work was suppressed, so other researchers were ultimately to make the same discovery, giving the granules different names, and prominent among these is Gaston Naissons, whose work is shown here. The concept underscoring pleomorphism is that the whole system is collaborative. The function of the microbes is not to harm, but to clean up toxic and damaged tissue, so that in the same way as you might find paramedics at the scene of many accidents, or firefighters at the scene of fires, it doesn't mean that paramedics cause accidents and firefighters cause fires, so that bacteria, viruses and fungi are the result, not the cause of disease. In this analogy, the allopathic approach is metaphorically to attack the paramedics or firefighters, which of course is grossly counterproductive. In addition, any pharmaceutical drugs given to kill the pleomorphic cleanup crew at this stage will further add to the toxin burden of the body. In fact, Rudolf Virchow, now regarded as the father of pathology, is quoted as saying, If I could live my life over again, I would devote it to proving that germs seek their natural habitat, disease tissue, rather than being the cause of the disease tissue. For example, mosquitoes seek the stagnant water, but do not cause the pool to become stagnant. On the widely accepted concept of germ theory, Antoine Beauchamp wrote, I draw the conclusion that normal air never contains microbes, maintaining in accord with the old medical aphorism that diseases are born of us and in us, that no one has ever been able to communicate a disease by taking the germ in the air, but they are isolated from a patient at some particular moment. That is, that the microbes only occur within living tissue and cannot be caught, as is now popularly believed. Both Antoine Beauchamp and Claude Bernard agreed that it was the status of the host terrain that was of paramount importance. Bernard was so convinced of the truth of this that in front of his colleagues he stated that the pathogen is nothing, the terrain is everything, before drinking a glass of cholera. Happily, he remained completely unscathed, as he had expected to, and others were later to emulate this demonstration. After having spent a professional lifetime sparring with Bernard, Pasteur is quoted as saying on his deathbed that Bernard was right, the pathogen is nothing, the terrain is everything. Once the cleanup is complete, the microzymas revert to their passive granular form. The final job of the microzymas is to return every living thing back to the soil from which it came when it dies. So the whole idea of catching something may be erroneous. Not that it can't happen, because it obviously does on occasion but that there are other factors such as nutrition and toxicity making the person vulnerable or receptive to the infection, along with other factors which may as yet be unidentified. Summing up the last 150 years or so, the naturopath Dr Michael Murray is quoted as saying, conventional medicine has been obsessed with killing the infective organisms rather than promoting defence against infection. And lastly, in addressing the myth that vaccines control the threat of infectious diseases, we will briefly address the issue of polio, since this is often claimed as one of the great triumphs of modern medicine. The term polio can be used to apply to a variety of different paralysing diseases. In the US, the facilities made available to polio victims during the epidemic in the middle of the 20th century were only for those diagnosed with viral polio so there was an economic imperative for hospitals to diagnose them in this way. However, most polio victims never received any kind of confirmation of a viral infection, and when a study was done in Detroit in 1958, only half of those so diagnosed were found to carry the virus. A mixture of pathogens have been implicated in other studies. Polio was assumed to be caused by a virus after two German researchers, Landsteiner and Popper, injected pulverised diseased brain tissue into the brains of two monkeys. One monkey died and the other became sick. While this might suggest a virus, it could be equally as valid for any toxins present, or may just illustrate that it's not a good idea to inject diseased pulverised brains into the central nervous systems of healthy animals. In fact, it bears mentioning that the polio virus is an enterovirus, 72 of which have been identified to date and all of which have proved harmless. <laughs>
An alternative theory advanced by Dr. Morton Biskind is that polio wasn't caused by a virus at all, but by the use of the pesticide dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane, better known as DDT. DDT was hailed as a wonder treatment after its discovery in 1939 by a Swiss chemist named Dr. Hermann Muller, and Dr. Muller was later awarded a Nobel Prize for his discovery. DDT is a central nervous system poison which has been shown to produce degeneration of the anterior horn cells in the spinal cord in animals. In 1945, DDT was released to the American public and it seemed like a magical answer which would kill all the lice that spread typhus and the mosquitoes that spread malaria. In 1946, two experts, Zimmerman and Levine, advocated the spraying of DDT on dairy cows, their feed and bedding. Although this didn't appear to cause any immediate harm to the cows eating the fodder, the health of their calves was severely impaired, sometimes with fatal results. As it turns out, the DDT bound to the fats in the cow's milk and was passed to not only the calves, but also to the humans which drank the milk. There followed the enthusiastic spraying of people, crops and environments with over three billion pounds of persistent pesticides in the US alone, and many of those who later suffered from polio were known to have been exposed in this way. This graph shows the combined effect of DDT, BHC or benzene hexachloride, which is a persistent organochlorine pesticide even more lethal than DDT, and lead and arsenic based pesticides, which were the major pesticides that had been in use prior to the advent of organochlorines in the early 1940s. These four chemicals are all persistent neurotoxins that can cause polio-like symptoms with the incidence of polio lagging just one to two years behind their production. Dr. Biskind regarded this operation as the most intensive campaign of mass poisoning in known human history. It may also have been that the extreme toxicity caused by these chemicals was altering the terrain as first described by Antoine Beauchamp and later elaborated on by Gaston Naissons, and that the presence of the polio virus was an effect of the toxicity rather than a primary cause of the paralysis. After 30 years of growing scientific evidence as to the harm to wild animals caused by DDT, it was eventually banned in the US in 1973. However, we still haven't resolved this issue a century later because specimens at autopsy or even biopsy are never sent for toxicological analysis and analysis of human breast milk and the cord blood of newborns both show its persistence some 50 years later. And although the use of DDT has been banned in many countries for decades now, sadly it still continues to be used in developing countries. So taking these factors into consideration, we can only credit vaccination with reducing the last remaining portion of disease, and even then the rate of decline was unaffected by the introduction of vaccines. Which brings us to vaccination myth 5, that vaccination is based upon sound science.